All right, now in Judges, chapter number 10, I don't do this very often, but I'm probably going to end up spilling into chapter number 11 a little bit this week also, uh, just because the content that we see in chapter number 10, there's one main point that I'm going to get to and we're gonna, I'm going to kind of preach on. There's, there's a lot of information given here, but not a whole lot that um, I'm going to cover just really in depth on. So like, let's just start reading here in verse number one. Just kind of depends on how long it takes me to, to express the, the main point that I think we could find in this chapter. Uh, that'll determine how far we get into chapter 11. But let's read here in verse number one. about says, And after Abimelech there arose to defend Israel Tola, the son of Pua, the son of Dodo, a man of Issachar. And he dwelt in Shamer and Mount Ephraim, and he judged Israel. 20 and three years and died and was buried in Shamer. Now, what we're getting through the book of Judges is basically an account of all of the judges that have been judging Israel, essentially. It's similar to the book of First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles that kind of just gives us a historical account of everything. And the Bible is taking, you know, making mention and taking note of specific judges that God wants to, you know, give us a lot more information on. So, you know, after Abimelech, that wicked king, or not king, they made him king, but he was a, a wicked judge, a wicked king. And um, after him, there arose here, it says, Tola, the son of Pua. So there's not a whole lot notable about Toa, according to the Bible, but, but it's letting us know, hey, there's this guy, and, he, and this is how long he was judging for. For 23 years, he died, was buried in Shamer. And then we have another guy, uh, Jay or Gileadite, and judged Israel 20 and 2 years. So we're getting an idea of how much time is going by as well uh, in between these judges. You know, Abimelech was really wicked. And the people at the time also reflected their heart wasn't right either when Abimelech was king because they made him king. Uh, the Bible says after... Um, after Gilead, or after, uh, excuse me, um, Gideon, after Gideon reigned, as soon as he died, the children of Israel were just like, nope, already going to serve Baal, serve Balaam, serve false gods. And it was just like, they were just waiting for him to die so they could just go back off into sin, into trouble and worshiping other gods. And then Abimelech arose and he, had, he basically had no problem with that. He killed his brethren. We saw that in, uh, last week in chapter number nine. And then after he died, now um, we've got a couple other judges that arise. Verse three, and after him arose Jair, a Gileadite, and judged Israel 20 and two years. And he had 30 sons that rode on 30 ass colts. And they had 30 cities, which are called Havoth Jair, unto this day, which are in the land of Gilead. And Jair died and was buried in Cayman. Verse 6, and the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. So it sounds like these other two judges were probably pretty decent judges because they were judging the children appropriately and they weren't going off and getting into sin and following other gods because in verse 6 it's saying, then they did evil again, right? So, and this is the pattern. We're going to see this all throughout the book of Judges. They're doing right for a while. Some decades go by. The, the judges die off that are, that are good judges, and then they just go right back into sin, right back into forgetting the Lord, forgetting the Lord that bought them, forgetting the Lord that delivered them out of bondage, all the miracles that he did, all the wonders, and just forget the Lord and go and worship and serve the gods of the people that were around them. And here we see them doing that again. It says, and they served Balaam and Ashtaroth and the gods of Syria and the gods of Zidon and the gods of Moab and the gods of the children of Ammon and the gods of the Philistines and forsook the Lord and served not him. They didn't even get deceived by like one other God, like, oh no, this is the real God. They just kind of went all over the place, like this God and this God or that God. And just, it was just Whatever, whatever they liked, right? Take your pick. It's a smorgasbord of gods and just whatever you just feel is good, just go ahead and worship that. No big deal. No integrity and no uh, trusting in the Lord at all or um, respect for the Lord that bought them. Number, verse number seven here, and the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. We've already seen this phrase, I think, at least three other times in the book of Judges. God just keeps getting angry with Israel when they go after these false gods. 
reason why it's, ver it's the first and second commandments uh, in the Ten Commandments, not having any other God before God, not making any idols, bow down to them, not worshiping them. God is serious about uh, being worshipped Him only. And it makes Him angry. The Bible says that God is a jealous God. God Himself said that I am a jealous God. Our God is a consuming fire. There is a lot to God. And, and what we're going to be covering tonight as we get into this is an aspect of God that does get preached here regularly, but isn't really quite preached in a lot of other places very often. And unfortunately, people have gotten a, an inadequate view of God because if you only ever hear about God's love, which is great, which is awesome. I mean, we just sing, love lifted me, right? I love the fact that God loved us. I love the fact that Jesus Christ loved us so much that he was willing to give his own life as a sacrifice to pay for our sins. I love that God the Father loved us so much to give us His only begotten Son to pay for our sins. There's a lot to love. Amen. Amen. And that is the overwhelming theme in Scripture is that God loves us, but we cannot ever lose sight of who God is because while God is love, as the Bible says, that is not all that God is. That is not the only defining characteristic of the Lord. If you think that's all that God is, then you don't know the God of the Bible. Because the same God, the same Bible, God's word that says that God is love, is the same book that talks about a hell, a place of eternal burning and torture and punishment. Where their, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched, where it's darkness, where people are weeping and wailing and gnashing with teeth and in utter destruction and pain and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever and they have no rest day nor night. It's the same God. And we need to remember that. The Bible talks a lot about having a, fel a healthy fear of the Lord. We love God. The Bible says perfect love casteth out fear. Do you have a perfect love for God? I don't. You know what? If I had a perfect love for God, I would be perfect. I wouldn't sin against God. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Well, by not keeping all of the commandments all of the time, that demonstrates that there's times when I don't love God. And it doesn't mean I don't want to. My spirit wants to. But my flesh is weak. I am not perfect. I do not have perfect love. We're trying to build and make that love greater. But right now, we don't have perfect love, so we can't cast off the fear of God. Because we need to fear God as His children when we decide to walk in the flesh and get off into sin. We need to fear our Father in heaven chastening us, punishing us, disciplining us. And we see this in Scripture. Let's keep reading here. The anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. Israel is His people. His chosen people. And he sold them into the hands of the Philistines and into the hands of the children of Ammon. He loved his children. He delivered them. He delivered his people out of Egypt, out of bondage. But when they turn away from him, when they stop doing what's right, when they go and serve other gods, he says, well, here's what's going to happen to you then. And he brings punishment in the form of of them going into bondage and having to serve under the Philistines and the children of Ammon and not being free. They're being brought back into bondage again. Verse number eight, in that year, they vexed and oppressed the children of Israel. Eighteen years, all the children of Israel that were on the other side, Jordan, in the land of the Amorites, which is in Gilead. Moreover, the children of Ammon passed over Jordan to fight also against Judah and against Benjamin and against the house of Ephraim so that Israel was sore distressed. So basically, you've got the children of Ammon and the Amorites 
and they're fighting and warring against Israel. And at that time, of course, they, they had their, um, basically all of their borders that was kind of originally given to them. And if you remember that there was one portion given to them on the other side, Jordan. So before they even passed over the Jordan River and fought Jericho and all the, all the events we read about in the book of Joshua, they had already conquered the land of, um, of Og, the king of Bashan, and um, who's that other king's name? Why do I, uh, that always escapes me when I stand up here. I don't know why. doesn't matter. They're over on the, uh, the east side of Israel. So basically, Ammon, the Amorites, they're already kind of conquering and, and subduing the children of Israel there. But then they get to this point, because that Jordan River is kind of a, a natural barrier, boundary for the nation of Israel. And they're able to cross over that then and still continue to oppress the children of Israel so that they're basically starting to affect a lot more in Israel than just a couple tribes on that side. And um, that's why it says here they were sore distressed. But look at verse number 10. The Bible says, And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. And this is something, you know, there's a reason why God brings the oppression is because He wants them to repent. He wants them to get right with them. He's punishing them. He's disciplining them. And oftentimes we know that's how we are. It takes people, unfortunately, it takes people to be brought down really low to be made humble in order to finally turn to God and just be like, God, I was stupid. God, I was wrong. And we've already seen these examples multiple times, but we're going to see something a little bit different out of God this time. And the reason being is because he's gone through this over and over again with them. Where they come back to them and then they fall away and they come back to them and they go back and they fall, you know, and this back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And after a while, God starts to get irritated with this and angry about that. Look what he says here in verse number, or verse number 10. It says, And the children of Israel cried on the Lord, saying, We have sinned against thee, both because we have forsaken our God and also served Balaam. So not only did they forsake God, but they're also just going and worshiping other gods, right? They've replaced God with with, with devil worship, with worshiping Balaam. Verse 11, And the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Did not I deliver you from the Egyptians and from the Amorites, from the children of Ammon and from the Philistines? The Zidonians also and the Amalekites and the Mayanites did oppress you, and ye cried to me, and I delivered you out of their hand. And he's just he's rebuking them here and reminding them, Look at all of these times that I have delivered you out of the hands of your oppressors, out of your enemies, and yet you still have continued to just put me aside, not care about me. Why is it now all of a sudden that you're only going to come to me when bad things happen to you? Verse number 13, yet ye have forsaken me and served other gods, wherefore I will deliver you no more. So I had it. You keep on doing this, I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm done with it. That's a scary place to be in where God's going to say, I'll deliver you no more. Now, there's two concepts here. There's, it's, it's a, they're both very similar, but I want to make sure that I'm clear about this because first of all, the way that God deals with a nation or a whole group of people is based on their works, right? Right? We know that our personal salvation, for God to be our Savior, we need to put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. He paid for our sins. That is what is required of us to receive a free gift. Believe on Jesus Christ. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's the dealing, how God deals with the individual soul. Amen. This is not the same way that God deals with a whole group of people or a whole nation. The whole nation as a whole doesn't have a singular soul. It's comprised of a whole bunch of people. So the way that God deals with nations is based on their works. It's based on, are you listening to me? Are you keeping my commandments? Are you doing what's right? If you're doing what's right, if you're following the Lord, 
He's going to bless that nation. He's going to do good unto that nation. And you can find this concept all throughout Scripture. Read the Old Testament. You see the blessings and the cursings. And he's saying, if you keep my law, I'm going to bless you and multiply you. And, you know, I'm going to make you to chase away your enemies. And I'll fight for you. And you'll have food and wealth. And everything's going to go well if you just decide to follow me. And if you don't, you're going to be brought into bondage. You're going to have hard times, difficulties. You're going to work and someone else is going to eat at your labor. You're going to, you know, you're going to be doing all this stuff and, and you're not going to be blessed. That's the way that God deals with nations. So here he's dealing with the children of Israel. Now we can, from time to time, and as I already alluded to, we make applications, right? And say, well, this is his people. And we could make some broad applications of, you know, how God might deal with someone who's saved. And I, but I just want to make sure I'm clear about this because there's another concept that we're going to go into just a little bit. I'm not going to spend very much time on it. I've done it in other sermons and I really don't feel like getting into that tonight just because I've done so many other sermons. And that concept is a concept of someone being a reprobate, someone being rejected of God, someone who has crossed the line with God to where they do not have a chance of salvation anymore. Where they've heard of God, they've understood who God is, they've heard the gospel, but they rejected it. And they have nothing to do with God. And God ends up giving them over to a reprobate mind, a rejected mind. The Bible says you can read Romans chapter 1 to do those things that are not convenient and, and goes on and on and teaches that doctrine. That is people who were never saved to begin with that have just pushed it too far with God in one way or another, whatever, whatever it may be. It's ultimately, though, what it boils down to is just a total, utter rejection of the Lord. That's what it is. They have just, they've heard God and they will have nothing to do with them and they've just decided, I reject the Lord. And... Um, as I said, I've preached entire sermons on the reprobate doctrine. I really don't want to get into that tonight because I want to focus a little bit more on believers or on nations, right? Because there still is redemption. There still is um, an aspect of, of being saved. Obviously, if you're already saved, you're saved. It's done. It's over. You have eternal life. Eternal means forever. You're going to live forever with God in heaven. Amen. Amen. As a child of God, you can never be unborn, no matter what you do. Now, you can be disciplined, you can be chastised, you can be chastened of the Lord, you can have a lot of bad things happen to you. You can have God say, you know what? I'm not going to fight your battles for you anymore. That's a very real place to be in. I'm not going to deliver you anymore. It doesn't mean your soul's not saved. It just means, you know what? I'm, I'm done. I've had it. And, and think about it this way. Think about parents who might have had kids growing up. And as a parent, you love your kid. You know, maybe they start getting into some trouble. You know, you discipline them, but they get in trouble at school or they get in trouble with the law and you're there to bail them out. You're there to help them out, right? They get busted by the cops. Well, I'm there to bail them out. I'm there, you know, they're my son. They're my daughter. I'm going to help them out. I'm going to take care of them. But you know what a lot of parents do after a while? They're going to say, okay, you made your bed. Now just live in it. You've done it. I I'm done bailing you out. I'm done helping you out. You need to have this happen to you. You finally need to just be punished for what you've been doing, and I'm not going to help you out of that anymore. And this is what's happening with the children of Israel. God just said, you know what? I'm done. He's not saying you're no longer my children, you're no longer my people, but he's just like, I've had it with, with you, just this back and forth game. Let's, um, let's keep reading here because we see, again, a little bit more into the attitude that God has. Uh, who God is, this is who God is. This is one aspect of who God is. We read a lot about his mercy. We re read a lot about his forgiveness. And even in the next chapter, we're going to see that God still ends up delivering him. God still uses Jephthah. Okay, it, 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 he will end up doing it. But look at verse number um, 14. Go, 
and cry unto the gods which ye have chosen. Let them deliver you in the time of your tribulation. So you're saying, what are you doing coming to me now? You chose your gods. Why don't you go to them? Why don't you go and bow down to that idol? Why don't you go and pray to them? You know, since you wanted to just, just have that be your God, go to them. Go to these idols then. You chose them. You made your bed. Now go live with it. This is part of God's character. Amen. This is something that we cannot forget. It's real. And it's, it's, it's one very good reason to not just think that God is just always, no matter what, going to help you out. Because he's not always going to. He doesn't promise to always help you out. Now, he could, if he saves your soul, he's not going to break his promise. He doesn't break any promises ever. He doesn't break a promise. He promised to save your soul through faith. Your soul is saved the moment you believe. That doesn't change. But all of the other blessings are based on your works, on how good you can follow the Lord. The, the rest of the blessings are based on that in this lifetime. So him fighting your battles for you, delivering you, saving you out of all these things, it's all based on how well are you listening, how good of a child are you being. And if you're going to be a bad child, well, he might just say, I'm not going to deliver you anymore. Let that sink in. Now, let's turn to, uh, keep your place here in Judges 10 and turn to 2 Samuel chapter 12. We're going to see another instance here. Because what happens also in this chapter, as we, we're going to continue reading, but even though God answered them roughly, because that is rough. He's saying, well, I'm not going to deliver you anymore. Go, just, go, just go to these other gods that you've chosen out. I think another reason why God answers them this way is because he's trying them and he's testing them. Is it real? Are they turning to him for real in their heart or is it for convenience just because they're in trouble now, right? Is it just going to be another episode of, well, now I'm in trouble, so we'll go to the real God now. Oh, yeah, hey, you know, save us, God, or, you know, Sorry, but, you know, sorry, not sorry. And they, and they just keep going on, right? So by saying, you know what, I've had it. But then they, they still are repentant, and they still are, are saying, well, God, you know, whatever you want to do, just, just help us out. But, but they show their sincerity in that they don't just return to those old gods. They, they still try to do what's right. And we're going to see here that there is a good reason to do that also, that because of God's mercy, because God is such a merciful God, it's always the right thing to do the right thing. Just because we understand that we might push things kind of far with God, it's never right to then just throw up your hands and give up and say, well, I've wasted my life, so just forget it. I might as well just go off the deep end and just die a miserable person. That's never the right answer. Even if you've screwed up time and time again with God and you've, and you've pushed them to this point. 2 Samuel chapter number 12 is a story of someone who's pushed things pretty far with God. It's a story of King David. After he commit adultery with another man's wife and had her husband killed in battle. Yeah, pretty bad. I think you're pushing things kind of far with God when you're going that far into sin and trying to cover it all up. He's confronted here by Nathan the prophet. Let's start reading in verse number 9. We're going to read through a lot of this passage. Verse number 9 in 2 Samuel chapter 12, the Bible says, Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and hast taken his wife to be thy wife, and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house, because thou hast despised me. 
and has taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house, and I will take thy wives before thine eyes, and give them unto thy neighbor, and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of this son. But thou didst it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin, thou shalt not die. David humbles himself here, and the one thing he does get from God is he didn't die. Now, the evil things that God pronounced against David, they all came to pass. His house had all kinds of problems with his children, with Absalom, with, you know, with all of his children. We see, um, you know, when Absalom went in unto his wives and, and, you know, he had to suffer that because of what he did. Notice it came back on him, you know, fivefold or sevenfold what he did to, um, to Uriah the Hittite. And verse number 14, let's keep reading here. It says, how be it because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme the child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. And Nathan departed unto his house, and the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bare unto David, and it was very sick. David therefore besought God for the child, and David fasted and went in and lay all night upon the earth. And the elders of his house arose and went to him to raise him up from the earth, but he would not, neither did he eat bread with them. And it came to pass on the seventh day that the child died. And the servants of David feared to tell him that the child was dead, for they said, Behold, while the child was yet alive, we spake unto him, and he would not hearken unto our voice. How will he then vex himself if we tell him that the child is dead? So what's happening here is that God struck the child with, with a disease, with sickness. And the whole time, David is just fasting and praying and on his face, humbling himself before God. No one can shake him. No one can get him up out of it. He is just beside himself, just mourning and praying and just earnestly trying to get God to show mercy on the child. This is what David is doing to the point to where the people are just like, when the child actually dies, they're afraid to even tell him because it's like, man, if, if he's behaving like this now when the child was still alive, what is he going to do when he finds out the, ch the child's dead? They're expecting him to just lose it, right? To just completely lose it because of how serious he was about, about trying to, uh, to pray for this child. But that's not how he responds. Look what it says in verse 19. But when David saw that his servants whispered, David perceived that the child was dead. So he knows they're all talking over there and he could kind of see and figure out, okay, the child must have died. Therefore, David said unto his servants, is the child dead? And they said, he is dead. Then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his apparel and came into the house of the Lord and worshiped. So even after the child died, you know, the whole time he's just trying to get God to change his mind about uh, killing the child. When he finds out that happened, does he get angry at God? No, he goes in and worships the Lord. And then it says, then he came to his own house and when he required, they set bread before him and he did eat. So he breaks his fast and basically is going to start to go back to, to normal. Uh, verse 21 says, Then said his servants unto him, What thing is this that thou hast done, that thou didst fast and weep for the child while it was alive, but when the child was dead, thou didst rise and eat bread? And he said, While the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, Who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? And this is the attitude that we see with the children of Israel. Even though God had pronounced against them, you know what, I'm going to deliver you no more, they still end up trying to do the right thing. They don't go back to those old gods because I believe they have the same type of an attitude. Well, who knows? Maybe God will still help us out. We're still going to just do the right thing. And, you know, when you get caught in a sin or anything like that, don't, again, don't just give up and, and just say, well, I've already done this, so now I'm just going to, I might as well just, just keep on sinning. It's, it's like, uh, you know, people who commit fornication. Young people especially, commit fornication one time, and it's like, well, I already screwed up one, so I might as well just keep on doing it. No, 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 wrong. 
that is absolutely the wrong thing to do. Or people say, well, I, I sinned, so now I'm just, I, I mean, I can't even go to church anymore. No, look, get right with God. Yeah, you may have to suffer some, some punishment. You may have to suffer at the hands of the Lord by, because you've, you've done wrong. David had to suffer what he's done wrong, but don't let that break you from ever serving God or from getting right with God. It's still the right thing to do the right thing. Don't give up. And don't give up because God is merciful. And who can tell? Who can tell if God will show mercy? He did it to the children of Israel. As we keep reading, we'll see that. We'll see that especially next week. Jephthah does deliver the children of Israel. But our hearts need to be right. God wants to see that change. When you've, when you've done something wrong, God wants to see you serious about, the, about that repentant heart, not just giving lip service. Look at that last verse of verse number 23. It says, but now he is dead. Wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? Basically saying, what good is it to do now? I mean, the, the child's already dead. You know, when he's alive, there was still hope. There was something they could do, but now he's dead. So it doesn't serve any purpose anymore. And then he says this, I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. And that's just, if you want to highlight or make note of that verse, it's an excellent verse to prove, to prove that babies, infants, children go to heaven. They're, they don't need to put their faith in Jesus Christ because they are innocent. Because they, they don't know the law. They don't know sin. They, they don't make conscious decisions. And they don't need to be baptized to be saved and go to heaven. They just are going to heaven because their name's in the book of life. Because it hasn't been removed yet. Because they hadn't committed any sin. Amen. And um, that is one scripture among a few, at least, that teach that, yes, when a child dies, they're going to heaven. He, that's why he said, he's not going to come back to me, but I'm going to go to him. And you know what? King David was saved. Amen. And he knew he had eternal life. And that's why he said he was going to him. He didn't think that that child was in hell and he's going to go to hell. Not at all. Now, uh, turn if you would to Jeremiah chapter 2. We're going to see another example here. And this one is probably a little bit more closely related because it's on the scale of the children of Israel as a nation. The example with King David was personal. That was, that was him and his personal sin and him trying to get right with God in his heart. Still have a good application, but Jeremiah chapter 2, we're going to see the children of Israel. And again, I mean, we're, we're in the book of Judges, which is before all of the kings. The book of Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah, is, kind of, is, is basically at the end of the reign of the kings is his lifespan where he's, he's preaching to Israel all the way up until they're carried away captive into Babylon and they go into Babylon. That, this is, that's the lifespan of Jeremiah. So the pattern doesn't change. They do good, they do bad. They do good, they do bad. They do good, and it just goes back and forth, back and forth. Jeremiah chapter number 2. Look at verse number 20. The Bible reads, For of old time I have broken thy yoke and burst thy bands. And thou saidst, I will not transgress. When upon every high hill and under every green tree thou wanderest, playing the harlot. Yet I planted thee a noble vine, holy, a right seed. How then art thou turned into the degenerate plant of a strange vine unto me. And, you know, he's basically saying, again, the same thing. I freed you. I broke your bands, you know, your, your chains, your shackles. I freed you. And you said, we're not going to transgress. We're not going to do anything wrong. But then what happens? They're going out. And when it mentions the high hills and the green trees, it's talking about the groves. These are all areas that they would use to worship false gods. They would set up these altars unto false gods in the high places and in the groves. And that's what he's referencing here. And when he says playing the harlot, he says they're being like a whore. They're being like a, a prostitute. 
because they're supposed to be married to the Lord. He's supposed to be their God. He's supposed to be their head. He's supposed to be their boss. And they're going to these other gods, these false gods, and, and playing the whore with other gods. He says, I planted thee. I, see, I, I made you noble. I made you upright, a noble vine, holy, a right seed. How then art thou turned into the degenerate plant of a strange vine unto me? How is it that you've fallen so far, far that you're just like this degenerate plant? I made you right. Verse 22. For though thou wash thee with nitre and take thee much soap, yet thine iniquity is marked before me, saith the Lord God. He's saying it doesn't matter how much you try to clean yourself up. You've sinned and you've sinned grievously. And I could see that sin still. Verse 23. How canst thou say I am not polluted? I have not gone after Balaam. See thy way in the valley. Know what thou hast done. Thou art a swift dromedary traversing her ways, a wild ass used to, the, used to the wilderness that snuffeth up the wind at her pleasure. In her occasion, who can turn her away? All they that seek her will not weary themselves. In her month, they shall find her. So he's, he's referring to the children of Israel here as a wild ass, right? A stubborn donkey just doing what it wants to do out in the wilderness and saying, you're telling me that you're clean and that you're not going after these false gods? This is what you're really like. You're not returning to me with your heart. Verse 25, withhold thy foot from being unshod and thy throat from thirst. But thou said, there is no hope. No, for I have loved strangers and after them will I go. As the thief is ashamed when he is found, so is the house of Israel ashamed. They, their kings, their princes and their priests and their prophets saying to a stock, thou art my father, and to a stone thou hast brought me forth. For they have turned their back unto me and not their face. But in the time of their trouble, they will say, arise and save us. You notice, it's the same attitude that God, you know, he's getting sick of them, you know, at your time of trouble. Yeah, when you're in need, that's when you come back to me. He's, I, I freed you, I did good unto you, I made you a right seed, I give you everything, and there you go, and you just go off and worship these other gods. But then when you're in trouble, guess where you're going to come running back to me again? Verse number 28. But where are thy gods that thou hast made thee? Let them arise if they can save thee in the time of thy trouble. For according to the number of thy cities are thy gods, O Judah. Exactly the same as what we're seeing in Judges. The reference to all these different gods, the reference to just going away from even to the point of God just saying, well, where are those gods? Why don't you just go follow them then? Why don't you let them save you, huh? They were good enough for you for all these years when you turned your back on me. Now, when you really need someone to save you, why don't you go to them? Verse 29, wherefore will ye plead with me? Ye all have transgressed against me, saith the Lord. In vain have I smitten your children. They received no correction. Your own sword hath devoured your prophets like a destroying lion. So he's really laying into them here. And, you know, throughout the book of Jeremiah, there's a lot of that. Obviously, it's a, because the children of Israel are at a point, and this is early on in the book before they actually are in captivity, where they, they need to be laid into because... They've done so much wrong and so much wicked and served other gods that the only thing God's left with is just completely removing them from the land and just putting them into exile and putting them under bondage in Babylon and just completely ripping them up and uprooting them from Israel and moving them somewhere else. Turn to Proverbs chapter 1. We need to learn how to recognize when we're going down the wrong path before it's too late. Before we get to the point with God where God's just like, you know what, I'm done. I've had it with you. I'm just going to read this for you as you're turning to Proverbs 1. Isaiah 55, 6 says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. You know what that implies? There's a time when God won't be found. There's a time when God won't be found. Don't be deceived by this false concept that God is just always there no matter what. 
It's not true. Amen. Not according to Scripture. As merciful and long-suffering as God is, and as many times as God will be there for you, you cannot rely on it being always. People have this false concept of thinking, oh, I'll get saved right before I die. Right? They have this plan. Because they, they first of all, it's, it's really because they have a false concept of what it means to be saved anyways. Because so many people think that you have to do good. You have to go to church. You have to do right things in order to be saved. But I don't want to do those things. I want to drink. I want to do drugs. I want to party. I want to live my life. I want to do all this stuff that I want to do here. But I don't want to go to hell. I still want to go to heaven. So when I breathe my last breath, you know, right before that is when I'll get saved. They won't. They won't get saved when they breathe their last breath. And it's not necessarily because God's just rejected them. It's because they don't even understand what salvation is. Because if you think that living a, a sinful life is just going to keep you out of heaven once you've already put your trust in, in Christ, then you don't understand salvation. Because it's not how good we live that saves us at all. That has nothing to do with it. Not even a little bit. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved. Grace is what you don't deserve. Grace is something that God just gives you even though you're a sinner, even though you've already transgressed against him. That's what you receive. You receive grace. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves, not of your church attendance, not of your prayer, not of your helping other people, not of how much money you put in the offering plate, not of how well you live your life, not of works, lest any man should boast. It's a gift of God. Unearned. That's salvation. And when you can receive that free gift, you're saved. You're saved forever. That means that even if and when you do sin, you're still saved because your works didn't save you. The works don't keep you saved. Obviously, we shouldn't live a life of sin, but the thing is, these people who want to push off getting saved, they think you have to do all these good things to be saved. Not true. And that's why if, if they have this plan of putting it off until they die, they're still not going to be saved because they've never understood salvation. There's no reason to put off salvation because it requires no work from you. Amen. God doesn't demand an oath or a vow that you are going to live right from that moment forward in order to be saved. That's not a requirement. The requirement is trusting that Christ paid for your sins. Not that you're going to do good from now on. Not that you're going to turn over a new leaf. Christ did it all. All to him I owe. Now look at Proverbs chapter 1. I didn't even finish reading it. Isaiah 55, 6. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. When we find ourselves getting off on the wrong path, hey, let's get it right with God right away. Not because we're worried about hell. We're not worried about that. But to get right with God so we don't have to go through punishment and chastisement. I mean, just, my kids don't like getting spankings. I don't like getting spankings from the Lord. Don't like it. Not fun. Already had plenty of them. Don't want any more. Proverbs chapter 1. And you know, we might not necessarily get into, uh, into chapter 11 because I've already been going on a little bit longer than I thought I was going to getting through these points. Proverbs chapter 1, again, we're just going to see one more example from Scripture about how God thinks in general, that, that it's, he's, it's, there is a point of pushing things too far with God. Look at verse number 22. The Bible says, How long, ye simple ones, will ye love simplicity? Now, when it's talking about simple ones and simplicity, it's not just like just things that are easy and simple. It's talking about being stupid. Being simple is another word for just being stupid. It's stupidity. How long, you stupid ones, are you just going to love stupidity? That's what it's saying there. We'll put it, we'll modernize it. I know the King James is hard to understand, but it's not that hard. 
How long, ye simple ones, who love simplicity, and the scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. Turn you at my reproof. He's saying, well, turn. When I tell you you're wrong, turn, change. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. Because I have called, look at this, because I have called and ye refused. Is it God didn't love these people? No, God did love them. He's calling them. I have called, but you refused. I've stretched out my hand. Hey, I'm here. I'm here to help you. He said, but no man regarded. Just walking right on by. Don't want your help, God. But you have set at naught all of my counsel. So everything that you're hearing from God's word, all the scriptures telling you what you're doing is wrong. I don't want to hear that. Don't tell me about that. And would none of my reproof, I also, I also will laugh at your calamity. Calamity means when you're in trouble. You didn't want to hear it from me. You didn't want to get wisdom. I offered, I was there, I held out my hand. You refused. You didn't want to hear it. Okay, now when you're in trouble, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to laugh. I will mock when your fear cometh. See, the people that refuse when God's stretching out his hand, they're haughty. They're lifted up in pride. They don't think they need God. <laughs> Lift out your hand to me. I don't need your help, God. What do I need from you? But then when things change in their life, and they're afraid. Think about that. Think about people being in fear, just being afraid. That is not a fun feeling to just to be in fear. All you want is someone to help you out when you're in fear. You know what God says? I'm going to mock. People need to pay attention and realize this is also characteristics of God. Let's take it seriously. That's why we need to take it seriously when he's offering his hand to you. So you don't get to this point to where he's mocking you when you're afraid. Because you brought it on yourself. When your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall they call upon me and I'll be right there for them. Help them out. Wait, that's not what it says. Then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. This is where the children of Israel were. They're in fear. They're being oppressed. They finally say, well, okay, let's call on God. And he says, you know what? No, go, see, go, go back to your other gods. Let them save you out of this. And he mocks them. Verse 29, For that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. And it's not like God hasn't been sending them prophets and sending them judges and sending them people saying, this is what you need to do. Their heart still wasn't right. Therefore, verse 31, Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. But whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from fear of evil. It's a very simple concept. God does hold us accountable for our own actions in this life. And you better believe as, as a child of God, he'll still hold you accountable. Now, it's not, again, not through a, a, a punishment of hell, but what you reap or what you sow in this world, you're going to reap it. We need to make sure our heart is to the point. Let's flip back now to, to Judges. We need to make sure our heart is right and humble enough to seek God early. When we start going around the wrong path, because you know what? It's bound to happen. At some point in your life, 
you're going to start backsliding. Nobody wants that. I don't want that to happen, but you know what's going to happen. As long as we're in this flesh, it, it, it's, it's inevitable at some point we're going to start backsliding. But the key is catch it early. Don't allow yourself to just sink further and further to the point where you just look like some degenerate vine unto God. What did you do? So I made you good. Let's finish off the chapter here. Verse number 15 in Judges chapter 10. And the children of Israel said unto the Lord, We have sinned. Do thou unto us whatsoever seemeth good unto thee. Deliver us only, we pray thee, this day. So they're saying, God, we deserve whatever you do unto us. You know, we're in your hand. Whatever it is that you think's good, however it is that you want to punish us, we deserve it. And this is the attitude that God wants us to have. So don't get that wrong. This is where we need to be when we do do wrong. And they're just asking, their, their, their only request at this point is just like, God, just please save us. Deal with us. And it says in verse 16, and they put away the strange gods from among them and served the Lord. And his soul was grieved for the misery of Israel. Turning away from God, serving other gods, that will bring you ultimately to misery. Israel is in a miserable condition. And you know what? God's soul was grieved for that. He still had a, you know, a soft spot for him. And that's ultimately why he ends up delivering him. But he sees their actions. He sees what they're doing. And he sees that they're getting right with them and that they were serious about it from their heart. Verse number 17, Then the children of Ammon were gathered together and encamped in Gilead, and the children of Israel assembled themselves together and encamped in Mizpeh. And the people and princes of Gilead said one to another, What man is he that will begin to fight against the children of Ammon? He shall be ahead over all the inhabitants of Gilead. Uh, next week we're going to go over it, we're, but just, I, I kind of wanted to make this point, but we're not going to go through all the verses for it. We're going to read them next week. But they are humbled so much that they turn to the son of a, of a harlot. Someone who is born, you know, one of their brethren that was born out of wedlock, that was already cast out from being among them, and that didn't have any good social standing or anything like that. He was already cast out. They have to basically grovel at his feet to get him to come back to help them out. It just shows you how low they've been brought and that, and that that's what they're, you know, they're willing to do to go and enlist Jephthah. But we'll, we'll get into all of that next week. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for um, the great truths that we could learn from Scripture. God, help us to get to know you better and more. And Lord, help us to have a complete picture of who you are, of your character, of your judgment, of everything, dear Lord. We want to know you better because we want to please you and... Um, God, we just ask that, that you would increase our knowledge and our wisdom. And Lord, we're, we're, we're not turning at your reproof for your correction, dear God. We're here. We want to know what we're doing wrong because we want to serve you even more, Lord. Help us to, um, to be stirred up and to be convicted in our hearts when we do end up sinning against you so that we don't just uh, continue down the wrong path. Lord, we want to seek you early and often, dear Lord. And I pray that you would please just bless our church, bless everyone here tonight. Lord, it's in Jesus' name we pray.